you guys can uh, grab a seat. Um, I'm gonna get a, can I get a podium? Somebody big and strong, bring me one of those. Um, while they are doing that, um, let me uh, quickly introduce myself. For those who don't know me, my name is Doug uh, Ponder, and uh, I work as a pastor at uh, Remnant Church in Richmond, Virginia. I also teach as a professor of biblical studies at uh, Grimke Theological Seminary, which is also in Richmond. Uh, if I look familiar, uh, it might be because I was here last year, or it might be because you've been raiding the candy at my table all week, which has been awesome too. Uh, so if you've got some Werther's, you're welcome. You know, I love them too. I don't care what Scott says. They don't make you old. They make you wise and full of good taste. Um, at any rate, I'm excited to be back. I'm gonna to talk to you today from Genesis 3, which is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. So if you wanna go ahead and turn there, do that. And then I'm gonna pray over us um, as we open God's word together. I know we just prayed, but um, can't hurt to do it twice. So can I pray for us while you turn your Bible to Genesis 3? Pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we open your word, we ask for your help. We ask that your Holy Spirit would work on our minds to help us understand and work in our hearts to help us believe these words, to see ourselves in the story that we're about to read and to see Jesus in the story too, so that we would understand everything that's gone wrong and how he's making everything right again. And we ask all these things in his name, amen. So this is movie uh, that came out way back in the early 90s, close to when the dinosaurs walked the earth. And um, it's not a great movie, but it has a great opening scene. Uh, there's a guy who's on his way home from the Lakers game. The Lakers are like the Pacers, only they win more, all right? So he's on his way home from the Lakers game, and he gets, he gets lost. He, he uh, doesn't know uh, where to go. He takes a wrong turn. And this is the world before Apple Maps, right? Google Maps, smartphones, GPS, you got none of that. So he's just taking guesses, hoping that uh, he's going in the right direction, that he's taking the right road. And the further he goes down the road he's chosen, the darker the street gets, the more deserted it becomes. And because it's a movie, well, you know, the worst happens, the nightmare scenario. His car breaks down in a horrible part of town. And as he gets out, he calls the tow truck driver on this thing called a car phone. All right, for anybody who was under 30, a car phone was like a cell phone, but it was the size of a briefcase and it was attached to your car. Also, a briefcase is like a man bag, but without a strap, okay? So it's really big. And he calls his tow truck driver, and while he's waiting for the tow truck driver to show up, five super rough-looking dudes corner him. And they start making threats against his life, demanding that he give them his wallet, his keys, that he walk away from his car. And right as things get super tense and you begin to fear for his life, the tow truck driver arrives. And he gets out, and he does something unexpected. He just super casually starts hooking the guy's car up, pretending and acting as if these rough looking gang members are not even there. And so the lead gang member is super offended, right? He feels disrespected, like he, he should be feared and he's not being feared. And he's of course angry that it, maybe this man is gonna interfere with this opportunity for some stolen car parts, some quick cash. So he goes over to him and uh, some PG-13 words are exchanged and then something totally unexpected happens. The old, wise tow truck driver pulls him aside. And like a good dad, or maybe a good pastor, he says a five sentence sermon that goes like this. Man, the world ain't supposed to work like this. Maybe you don't know that, but this ain't the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be able to do my job without asking you if I can. And that dude is supposed to be able to wait with his car without you ripping him off. Everything is supposed to be different than what it is here. Now, like I said, it's not a great movie, but it does have a great opening scene. Everything is supposed to be different than what it is here. And I think you can feel that inside of yourself. And you can certainly see that across the tragedy that we call human history. So full of corruption and oppression, senseless wars, awful atrocities, cruel selfishness, remarkable stupidity. Listen, anyone can see that the world is not the way it's supposed to be. However, not everyone understands what went wrong, nor how things are going to be made right again. But Genesis 3 tells us all of this. That's why it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It tells us why we do what we do, why we're drawn to all the selfish, 
stupid and self-destructive things that we do. And more importantly, it tells us what the Lord has done to meet us in our mess and to fix everything that we made wrong, starting with us. Everyone can agree the world's not right. And that's where we need to start today. Start with what I'm gonna call the end of the beginning, which is how things got to be the way that they now are. Remember, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, paradise. It's been wonderful to talk about that, to hang out there for a couple sessions together. But that's not the world we live in anymore. We're now gonna see the end of the beginning. How did things get to be the way that they are? Look at verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now the story of what's wrong with the world starts with this serpent figure. And later biblical authors tell us this is the devil, also known as Satan. Uh, You can read about that in Revelation 12, uh, verse seven, which identifies him as that ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. Now I know a lot of questions come up here. A lot of questions come up here. Like was Satan speaking through a regular snake or were serpents something more back then? Why were Adam and Eve not alarmed by a talking creature, right? Does that mean everything was like Narnia back then when all the animals could talk and we could talk with them? Also, where did Satan come from? Wasn't the world very good like three seconds ago? A lot of questions. Well, can I, can I teach you something really important that one of my seminary professors taught me? I think it's very, very helpful. The Bible is not an answer book, despite what you've been told. And what I mean by that is the Bible is not the kind of book where you can take the questions that you want to ask and then go there and it has to answer them for you. That's, not, that's just not true. Right? That's why you can't go to the Bible and find out eh, what happened to dinosaurs, for example. God doesn't tell you, sorry. It's because the Bible's not an answer book. It's more like a question and answer book, by which I mean this. The Bible tells us the questions that matter most, the ones that we would have asked if we knew enough to know what we should be asking. The Bible tells us the questions that matter most, and then it answers those. You see the difference? And so here's what it's telling us here. The Bible is not Satan's origin story. You know, every comic villain's getting their own origin story now. The Bible, eh, it's not that interested in giving you Satan's origin story. There's just a couple verses in the whole Bible about that. The Bible's really interested in giving you your origin story, the human origin story. And that's why it doesn't focus on what went wrong with Satan. It just focuses on what went wrong with us, how things got that way and how God's gonna fix it. And to be honest, that's all the information we need to know. So back to the serpent's question. He said, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, there's an important lesson here that we need to notice. The fall of humanity into moral rebellion and every horrible thing that's come downstream from that, it all began with a temptation to doubt what God had clearly said. Speaking through the serpent, Satan said, did God actually say that? Did he really say you can't do this or that? And and who knows what would have happened if Adam and Eve had said, yeah, he said it, now go away. I don't know what would have happened. They didn't do that. Instead, they let him hang around. And the serpent's question finds a foothold in their hearts. And let's be honest, we know what that's like, don't we? How many times have you bumped into some truth in the Bible, some practice of the Christian faith that maybe is very difficult or very, very unpopular? And you're tempted to wonder, well, maybe God didn't say this after all. Maybe it's not really wrong to do this. Maybe what I wanna do is right. And maybe anybody, including God himself, is wrong to try to stop me. Can I just tell you, that is the path that leads to destruction. The author of Proverbs Proverbs says more than once, there's a way that seems right to a man. Can I translate that for Gen Z? There's a way that feels right to you. You're gonna say, it feels right to me but its end is the way to death, the Bible says. That's why it's so important to know what God says in his word, to build your life on that. Like we just sang a second ago, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know thus saith the Lord. Did God really say? Yeah, he really did. But now look at what happens next, verses two through five. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, any of them, but God said, you shall not eat of this fruit, of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, 
Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, He will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. I want you to see the subtle shift in tactics here. If Satan can't get you to doubt what God said, then he's going to lie to you and get you to doubt why God said it. His lie was basically this. If you obey that command that God said, first off, it's, he lied to you about the consequences. It's not actually going to kill you. In fact, maybe the opposite is true. If you obey that command, you'll never know what it is to really live. He's going to ruin your life. God's holding you back. He's keeping you down. If you trust and obey him, you're going to miss out on the best this world has to offer. God doesn't want you to be happy. He's not really for you. He's against you. Listen, Satan's a lot of things, but dumb ain't one of them. He knows the best way to tempt Adam and Eve to distrust and disobey the Lord was to get them to doubt, not that God is real, but that God is good. You see the difference? The devil's strategy is the same today. He still whispers to me and you, if God were really good, he would let you do what you want. He would never give you commands and rules. That's only what strict, mean, judgmental people do. If God were really good, he would affirm you in everything that you are. If God were really good, he would never judge or punish anybody. You see how it works? People are not born atheists, even in a fallen world stained by sin. People are born sinners who want to do what we want to do. So the truth is this. Anytime we bump into something that contradicts our desire, whether it's a desire to sleep with whoever we want or to spend our money however we want or spend our lives however we want, any truth that contradicts our desires, we take, we're primed to take as evidence that God isn't good, therefore he can't be trusted. And if he can't be trusted, he definitely shouldn't be obeyed. That's why we're tempted to sin, every one of us. Temptation wouldn't even work unless in the midst of that temptation, we were somewhere believing that maybe we can't trust God. That's what Satan whispers to us, this lie from the very beginning. If you obey the Lord, you'll be miserable. He'll wreck your life. He doesn't want you to be happy. So you need to take matters into your own hands. Speak your truth. Choose your good. Live your life. And tragically, the lie worked. Look at what happened next. Verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable for making one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now here's the question you ought to ask yourself, right? Okay, we've been waiting for this buildup. How did things get the way that they are? We know the world's busted and everybody can feel that. But how did it get this way? What was the great and horrible thing that they did that led to all the terrible stuff that we see all the time? And the answer is they ate from a tree. Has it ever, you're like, what? Really? That? Well, I have two things to say about that. The first is, this reminds me of a great quote from C.S. Lewis in his classic book, Mere Christianity. He said, Christianity is not a religion that you could have guessed. It has, it's not the sort of thing that you would have made up. It has just that odd twist of truth about it that real things have. Okay, but what's the deal with the tree though? Well, here's the deal. In Genesis four, one dude kills his brother. That's obviously wrong. Nobody sees that. You're like, I get that. You know, that's a bad thing. But this, what's the problem? What's the big deal? What's so bad? How is that the problem that led to everything else? Well, do you remember what it was called? It's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But that doesn't mean that Adam and Eve had no knowledge of what was right and wrong. They, they weren't allowed to kill each other. They knew that. They, they weren't allowed to lie again to God. There was lots of things they knew. This represented the knowledge in the sense of the authority to define what is right and wrong. The tree was a real tree, but it was also a symbol. It represented the authority to say, this is good, that is bad. This is right, that is wrong. I can do this, I can't do that. It represented the authority to do what only God can do. And that's why the serpent said this to them. He said, God knows that when you eat of this tree, you will be like him in this way. And here's the truth, Adam and Eve and everybody since then, me and you, we've all wanted that authority to define right and wrong for ourselves, right? To do what we wanna do. And the Lord told them, but if you do that, you're gonna die. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. 
So the question at this point in the story, all the tension is, are they gonna trust the Lord? Are they gonna depend on him? Or are they gonna give in to the temptation to assert their autonomy and seek independence and try to become like God instead of trusting that God is good, that God knows what he's talking about and that therefore his commands are for our good. Can can I just show you? That is still true today. There's not a tree in your backyard that God said not to eat from. But do you know what he does say? Trust me, obey me. And at the back of that command, at any command you want, literally flip the Bible open, find a command, any command that is for you, do you know what stands beneath that? It's the tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the authority to define right and wrong. And God is saying, don't put yourself in my place. Trust me, obey me. Horrible things happen when you don't. Can I give you just one example? We don't have time for a lot, so let me give you just one. Let's take the least popular command out of the 10 commandments. I think in 2023, the least popular command of all the 10 commandments is thou shalt not commit adultery. That means you can't sleep with whoever you want. You have to wait until you get married and a man has to marry a woman and sexual activity outside of that, whether it's before that or during that, but with somebody other than a man or a woman who are married to one another, it's wrong. And God is clear about that. And the church has been clear about that for 2000 years as well. But the world hates this. It says the Bible's teaching in that area is restrictive, it's regressive. It's holding you back from all the good that you would have and all the joy and all the fun and your identity and all these things. It sounds like the devil, right? Did God really say that? And if he did, is he really good to stop you from doing what you wanna do? Can you hear it? But have you ever considered the alternative? What would the world look like if we did obey that command? Well, there would be no more sexual abuse, no more sexual assault, and therefore no Me Too movement. There would be no more pornography, and therefore none of the evils that come with that, like the drug addiction and the sex trafficking. There would be no more unfaithful spouses who rip marriages apart, and therefore no more single moms, and therefore lots less poverty. There would be no underage teenage pregnancies, which means far less abortions. And there would be no STDs like AIDS, which has killed millions of people. Do you see the horrible things that we unleash, that we bring into the world when we go against what God requires? Who do you think is behind all of that? It's not the Lord. His commands would have kept us from all of that. It's our enemy. He wants you to doubt what God says. And if he can't get you to do that, he'll get you to doubt why God said it. He'll make you think he's not good, that he's holding you back from something great. But I just want you to see, that's a lie. The truth is God is good. He's the author of life. The Bible says that at his right hand is a never ending waterfall of pleasure forevermore. And he offers that to you when you come to him, when you trust in him, when you give your life over to him because nothing good will ever happen by going the opposite direction from the God of life. We're just gonna open Pandora's box all over again, unleashing new evils of every kind into the world, affecting ourselves and others in many ways. In fact, I want you to see what happens next. Welcome to the fallout. The other side of the fall into sin. Welcome to the fallout. This is what life is now like on the other side. We don't have to talk long about this because we we live this out all the time. I just want you to see a couple details in the story that maybe you haven't recognized before. So read verses seven and following with me. Then, right after they ate, the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And the man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Then God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the the woman you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent, the he deceived me. That's why I ate it. See, these verses give us a glimpse of of every human heart on the other side of our fall into sin. What, What has sin done to us? It's turned us into hiders, into blame shifters, into people who seek phony covering for ourselves. Did you see that? 
Adam and Eve tried to cover up their shame with fig leaves. They try to hide from God among the trees. And when those strategies don't work, they try to pin the blame on somebody else. It wasn't my fault, God. It was the woman you gave me, which is kind of like blaming both. There's only two other souls on the planet. He's like, it was definitely not me though. It was you and her, but not me. And the woman's like, it won't me. It was that guy who talked through the snake. That's who it was. Don't we do the same thing? Like the hiding's obvious, right? Nobody likes getting caught when we mess up. Our first instinct is not to confess, but to conceal. We try to hide. We even lie. It's a form of hiding so we don't get caught. But what do we do when we're caught though? What do we do? We blame shift. We find some way to minimize our guilt. We say, it wasn't my fault. Uh, uh, here's an explanation. I had a bad upbringing. I didn't take my meds. I didn't get enough sleep last night. I, I, I what we we lie, we hide, we blame shift, and we also actively do this other thing. We try to cover ourselves, not with fig leaves, right? But with suits of self-righteousness, with like attempts to look good in the eyes of other people because we don't feel good about ourselves. Do you know what I mean by that? What we try so hard to do things and say things to look good in the eyes of other people because we have this gaping hole. We feel this gap between who we should be and who we actually are, and we try to close that gap with kind of performance. That's like... Isn't that 97% of social media? Like 1% is your mom reposting recipes on Facebook. 1% is your grandma sharing her Candy Crush score. She didn't even know how she did it, but her Facebook wall is like continual updates. And 1% is somebody sharing stuff about theology and politics, okay? But they have the 97%. That's pretty much people performing for the public saying, affirm me, like me. Tell me I'm pretty or that I'm strong or that I'm cool or that I did something good. Help me feel better about me. I just want you to see that this goes all the way back to what began in the garden. Trying to cover up the shame we feel, the guilt we have, we are drawn to anything that will make us feel better about who we are or what we do. But here's what you need to hear. Hiding, blame shifting, and fronting can't change anything. These are misguided strategies that leave us in the same place they left Adam and Eve, running and hiding from the only person who can actually help us. But here's the good news. Even though it's in our nature to run and hide whenever we mess up, it's in God's nature to seek and find. In fact, that's why God asked the question, where are you? It's, it's not because he didn't know. Do you know what I mean? Like God didn't have to ping Adam's phone. Bing, 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 bing. You know how your iPhone does that? You guys know about that feature? My wife lost her phone one year and we could not find it. And my friend was like, well, have you used the, you know, find my phone feature? And I was like, no, I mean, I'm an idiot. I didn't even know that existed. Tell me, teach me. So he's like, yeah, pull it up. If you have family share turned on, you can go in there and you can press this little like green blue circle thing. And you can say, find my device and ping your wife's phone. We heard this far and distant away echo. Bing, 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 bing. Bing, 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 bing. We're like going through the whole house. Where in the world is your phone? She had packed it up with her Christmas decorations. We were about to not have a phone for a long time. And what was gonna happen is we're gonna replace it, right? We're gonna buy it. And then next Christmas, ta-da, you get an old phone for Christmas, right? That's not what's happening in the garden. God's not pinging Adam's phone. Where are you, bro? I hear a distant echo among the trees, but I can't see. This is the God of the universe. He already knows. So why does he ask? I'll tell you why he asks. We ask God questions because we don't know the answer. God asks us questions because he's trying to help us see something that we ought to know, but that we haven't faced yet. He's helping them see, do you see what your sin has done to you? Do you see what it's turned, turned you into? You used to walk with me in the garden in, in the day, and now you're running and you're hiding from me, and I'm not the one who's changed. Do you see that? This is so important. They're now running and hiding from God. This is what sin does for all of us. It makes us run and hide. But God does not leave us there hiding in the dark. Jesus says, the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And I just want you to see that that seeking began on the same day that we fell and it hasn't stopped since then. This is what I call the beginning of the end. This is where we find hope. This is where we find healing. This is where we finish today. Genesis 3 doesn't have a happy ending in the same way that we want, but it does have the promise of a happy ending. It's super important that you see that. It starts with the Lord's judgment on the serpent. He says, verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat 
all the days of your life. All right, let, look at these words. Let me tell you what I don't think they mean. I don't think God was cursing snakes because snakes are not a real problem, right? Revelation 12, seven said it was the serpent acting through the snake. Second, snakes don't literally eat dust. They eat like mice and stuff and bugs. I know this because I used to catch snakes with a guy in my neighborhood and sell them to other kids. We did it at $10 a snake and we charged 20 for the venomous ones. I only ever sold one of those. What happened was his mom was like, what kind of snake is this? He was like, it's a water moccasin, it's a cotton mouth. Immediately called my mom, right? No more snake sales. That's how that went. Listen, snakes are not a real problem. Satan's our real problem. Snakes don't eat dust and they already crawl on the ground. So I don't think this is saying that God ripped legs off of snakes and they don't, they don't have to do that now. So what is it saying then? Well, if you realize that this is a curse on Satan himself, then when you read the words, cursed are you above all livestock and beasts of the field, I think he's saying that Satan, whom Ezekiel 28 tells us was once an angel who like, like the creatures in Isaiah six flew around the throne of God is now of a lower status than even the most brute animals. And crawling on his belly refers to humiliation. He's not flying around like seraphim in the presence of God. He's now forced to crawl like a prisoner in chains. And finally, that phrase about eating the dust, that's like what we mean when we talk about enemies licking the dust. In fact, the prophet Micah says exactly the same thing. You can look it up later. But in Micah 7, 17, he says, the enemies of God will lick the dust like a serpent. All right, God is promising that our greatest enemy will be defeated. And he tells us in verse 15, how that will take place. He says, I will put enmity, that's hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring, that's your children, your seed and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you, that's the serpent, will bruise his heel. This is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. It tells us a couple things. First, all of human history is this grand struggle between good and evil, a war between Satan and everybody who sides with him versus the woman's offspring and everybody who sides with him. Now listen, I know it is not popular today to talk about good guys and bad guys anymore. We don't like movies like that. We like our heroes to be flawed and we like the villains to be complicated. You know, we sympathize with them. Nobody wears an all black or an all white hat anymore. Everybody's a shade of gray. But God says, actually, that's not the way the world is. If you side with Satan and continue in your rebellion against the God of life and love and infinite joy, then you're one of the bad guys and you're on the losing team. To borrow a phrase from popular culture, if you're siding with the serpent, then you're on the wrong side of history. But the good news is it doesn't have to stay that way because Jesus will win and Satan will be defeated. And this verse is teaching us that one day, the seed of the woman, that's Jesus, will strike the head of the serpent, even though he himself would be struck by the serpent as well. And that might sound like an even fight. They're both striking each other, trading blow for blow, but it ain't so. You can survive a great wound to your heel, but you don't survive a fatal blow to the head. And that's why this verse is sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel all that it means is that it's, it's announcing the good news, picturing what Jesus would do for us on the cross when he let the devil strike him. And for three short days, maybe, the devil thought, I've done it, I've won. But when Jesus got up on that Easter morning, he shook off his heel wound and he signed the devil's death sentence. And you can read all about that in Revelation 20 if you like, but I'll give you the spoiler alert, Jesus wins. Jesus wins and therefore you win if you're with Jesus. Now, let me show you how our story ends, which shows us how we get to be with Jesus. How do we get to join the winning side? How do we come to lay down our arms, to be forgiven of our rebellion and to become part of the winning team? How do we get to let Jesus's victory count for us in the place of our failure? Well, verse 20 and 21 say, the man called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. I want you to see how God replaces their phony fig leaf covering with something real. He covered the shame and guilt of Adam and Eve, not with some flimsy fig leaves, but with garments made from skin, which you can't get unless an animal is killed to get them. See, Adam and Eve deserved to die for their sin against the Lord. That's what he promised them. Genesis 2, we saw it this morning. Don't eat from the fruit of the tree of the garden or you will die. That's what they deserved. But instead, God took the life of an innocent animal 
And so far as we know, that's the first time that they ever witnessed the death of a living creature. What do you think they thought in their mind as they saw something die for the first time, knowing that it should have been them? Why did this poor thing die in my place when it should have been me? Does that sound like anything you know? Guys, that's the whole point of the sacrificial system that God gave to his people in Israel. Every year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would slaughter an innocent animal. He would go into the most holy place. He would go into the focused presence of God. He would take the blood of the animal with him. He would sprinkle it on the altar. He would remind himself and all the people of the costly wages of sin that rebellion against the God of life means death. And every year, the people would have seen this happen and they surely must have wondered why that innocent animal instead of me. This animal did nothing wrong, whereas I do wrong constantly. I fail to do the good that I want to do, and I can't stop doing the bad that I want to avoid. Who is going to rescue me from my life of sin and death? And when Jesus showed up, John the Baptist gives the answer. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If you know Jesus, if you trust in him, if you look to him to cover your sins, then you've been clothed with something far greater than Adam and Eve. You've been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. That means your sins have been forgiven. Your shame's been covered. Listen, all of it, all of it. Do you know what that means? It means there's no reason to lie or hide or blame shift anymore. There's no need to cover your shame with fig leaf suits of any kind. Number one, because they don't work. Jesus sees you as you really are, but number two, because they're not needed. Everything you're trying to run from and hide from, everything you're tempted to explain away by blame shifting, everything you've ever done, Jesus already saw it and he didn't just see it, he dealt with it on the cross. The apostle Paul puts it like this in Colossians two. He says, and you, you who were dead in your trespasses, that sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, This is what God did for you. He made you alive together with him, that's Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with all of its legal demands, everything that we should have done but we failed to do. He said he set this aside, nailing it to the cross. And don't overlook this verse. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. I put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. The rulers and authorities is one of the ways of talking about the demons, the devil and his demons, the powers of hell. And look at what he says. He says that when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't just erase your record of sins. He also also triumphed over the devil and judo chopped the weapons out of his hands. Do you see that? By disarming them. You're like, what does that mean? Well, what are the weapons of the enemy? Fear of death, Hebrews 2 says, and the guilt and shame that Adam and Eve experienced immediately in the garden. So what, what do we do with this? Well, you already know. Do you know the words of that old hymn? When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because the sinless savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Keep going. Behold him there, the risen lamb, because he didn't stay dead. And he remains my perfect spotless righteousness, not my fig leaf righteousness. He's the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. One with himself, that means with him, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my savior and my God. That's what Jesus has done for you. And one more. Look at verses 22 through 24, we're done. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword turned every way to guard the way back to the tree of life. I want you to see that the exile, getting kicked out of the garden was actually both an act of judgment and an act of mercy. The judgment's easy, you already see that, right? Sinners don't have the right or the ability to remain in the presence of a holy God. But did you ever think that the act, The exile was an act of mercy too? What did God say? He said, we've got to keep the man and woman from eating of the tree of life while remaining in their sin, thus living forever in a state of what? Relational separation from the Lord. What is that? That's literally what hell is. Hell is living forever in the presence of a God that you don't like but can't get away from. God says, I'm going to spare you of that. And Jesus comes on the scene and says, I'm going to change and fix all of this. 
He cleanses us, removes our inability to be in God's presence, but that's not all he does. He sends his spirit to change our hearts and our desires. He covers our shame, removes our guilt, and therefore turns people who used to run from God into people who run to God. And that's how the whole Bible ends. Look at what Jesus says in the very last book of the Bible. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. In what? In the blood of the Lamb. So that they may receive right to what? The tree of life. There it is. And they may enter the gates. What gates? The gates of the garden city of God. They're no longer shut, no longer guarded by angels with flaming swords. Instead, these gates are flung wide open. And they're still open for you today. Some of you have already walked through those gates, but other of you need to do that today. Come to me, Jesus said, all who are weary and heavy laden, which means all who are full of guilt and fear. And I will give you what? What does he say? I will give you rest. What an interesting word choice. Rest, like the rest that Adam and Eve had in in Genesis 2. Rest like it was in the beginning. Rest like in the garden, in the world before sin. Yes, as it was in the beginning, so it is even now, and so shall it ever be, world without end. That's the hope that we see from Genesis 3. We've messed up quite a bit, but what we've done, all that we've done wrong, is nothing compared to Jesus' ability to make it right. And the good news that we see from this passage is that one day, when we're with Jesus in glory, all of the darkness that there ever was, if you set it next to light, it would barely fill a cup. Jesus Christ has won the victory for you and he invites you into that even now. For those of you who know him, you've already entered that rest. Others of you, you need to do that today. You don't have to do anything except look to Christ. See what it is that should have happened to you but never will because Jesus died in your place and that's it. Then give the rest of your life to trusting him and following him as we've been talking about all weekend. Let me pray for you and then we get to sing about this good news. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the good news that your grace is greater than all our sin, that you did go to the cross and you died, but you didn't stay dead. You rose again, and in that way, the Bible calls you our living hope. We thank you that we get to leave the conference this weekend with a fresh reminder of this hope. Would you send us from this place rejoicing and who you are and what you've done for us? We ask all of this in your name.